Welcome back to Way of the Wrench and on today's very special episode we are going to take all of those pieces that we have been laying out carefully and cutting and drilling and we are going to make it look like this by the end of the episode. So stick around, you're not going to want to miss it. Alright, now that we have all of our pieces cut and ready to go, it's time to start thinking about how to put this thing together. Now there's a lot of ways you can put this together, including how I put my Raspberry Pi arcade cabinet together. So if you're not sure about that, I'll put a link above and you can see how I did it that way. Using glue up blocks and screws in from the side and then just simply filling them with wood filler after and sanding and get a very solid, straight 90 degree cabinet. But I wanted to do something different for you, I try to have these videos different every time. So this time I'm going to show you guys how to do pocket holes and uh, we're also going to back these up with those glue blocks just like I did in the Raspberry Pi arcade so that this thing is bulletproof. So let me show you what I got. What I got here is a Craig 720 pocket hole jig system. Now this is a little bit pricey. I figured if I was going to buy this and have a tool for the shop long term that I might as well buy what they have that's the best. So this is the 720. Uh, it was about 170 bucks but you do not need to spend that much to do this project. In fact you can do exactly what I'm going to show you with a $25, the, the very low end Craig pocket hole jig setup. So don't be afraid you can get the cheaper one and still do this. So let me quickly show you how to set this up and we'll get going. All right, take your jig and set it up on your table. The kit comes with a clamp so that you can clamp it to your table so it doesn't move around on you. And then the 720, it's got these little latches on the back that you can undo and swing these back. And those are what's gonna support your material when you lay it in here. On the back of the jig, you're gonna to wanna to take this little blue tool out and then use the tool to measure the thickness of the material that you're going to do the pocket holes in. So for example, it's right in this notch here, which is marked at three quarter inch, and this is three quarter inch plywood. Then grab the drill off the back of the jig. Then using the blue tool and using this little Allen key here, you're going to put it inside this little set screw like that. And lefty loosey will loosen up the collar so that you can move it on the shank of the drill. And what you're going to do is use this big hole to line up with these various circles or the different settings or the depth stops for the thickness of material you're using. So for example, you can see in there, I've got it about three quarters. So this is going to be good for three quarter inch plywood. Now, if you also notice, I am at just a touch, a little lower, closer to kind of the skinnier half inch side. And the reason for that is if you ever have problems with your pocket hole screws going through the material, just a touch, like the, the bare end of the screw going, poking through, if you set this a tiny bit lower, then that'll prevent that from happening. Once you have it set, put the Allen key back in. Righty-tighty, make sure it's nice and snug because you don't want this adjusting on you. Now you grab your material you want to put your pocket holes in and the beauty of pocket holes is it doesn't really matter where you put them because you're going to be putting a screw without a pilot hole into the other material. So there are some guidelines though. I would put them at least one to one and a half inches from the ends and then after that you can space them out every six to eight inches. So let's put one in at the end at an inch and I would make the lines quite long so that you can line it up in the jig. So let's do the ends here first. And then roughly that's about 12 inches, so just for sake of the video, we'll put one roughly in the middle. Now you put your material down into the jig and it should sit on these kind of wing extensions just to support it. And what you're going to do is you're going to pick one of these holes. You don't have to use all of them and you can use any of them you want and line it up with the lines that you extended to where you want this. So I'm going to use this one here and remember it doesn't have to be absolutely perfect. And then on this one, all you got to do is actually clamp it down like that and as long as it's holding it nice and tight and it's not going to move, you're good. If you need to, there's a knob on the side here that you can adjust with this off. Just creep up on it slowly so that it has enough tension to hold this without causing any damage. And then this kit comes with a little vacuum attachment. You want to put the open pocket to the front. There's a quick release button if you need to take it off after. And then there's an adapter so that it can fit your actual shop vac or your vacuum. This one goes on like that. And then just take the hose from your shop vac and plug it into the adapter. And make sure you turn on your shop vac before you start drilling. Now what this does is it clears all the wood chips out of the jig so that you don't have any problems with wood chips causing the drill not to go to the proper depth when you drill. Then take the drill bit that you've already set up, put it into a drill, insert it into the hole where you want to drill, and then before you start, let it get up to operating speed, and you're going to keep drilling down until the bottom of this collar stops on the top of the jig. At that point, take it off and inspect your hole.
There you go, one pocket hole ready to get a screw in there and have something installed. So all you do is you just repeat wherever you've marked for your other holes and continue. Now when you start assembling your cabinet, it is really tempting to put these ugly pocket holes to the inside of your cabinet. That way you don't have to see them, you don't have to fill them with wood filler and sand them and do all that extra work. However, if you do that, what happens is you are now putting the screws at an angle so that the screw is grabbing to the very edge of the piece underneath and there's not a lot to bite into so you get up with a, a loose joint and uh, it sometimes pushes the wood out the end here. So you're gonna wanna have these pocket holes to the outside of your cabinet. That way that screw is angled inside and you're gonna get a bigger, uh, more material to grab into and it'll be a stronger joint. And it's not the end of the world. We can fill this with some wood fill, let it dry overnight, give it a quick sand and now uh, you won't even see it. And we have to sand the front anyway. So not a big deal. Now the next issue is because the screw is at an angle like this, when you go to tighten it up, there's a good chance that this is gonna move on you in the direction that the screw is pulling in. So we have to have a way to stop that from moving. So let me show you what I got for you. All right, so the first solution I have for you is why not use what Craig is designed to work with this system. So this is the Craig pocket hole clamps and they're not the cheapest. They're about $40, $45 each and you do need two of these to get this to work. Uh, what's cool about them is this spot here on the clamp goes right into the freshly drilled pocket holes we just did. And the other side here goes on the other edge of the other material so that when you clamp it, it holds the two together nice and tight while you put in your screws. Now, if it's too loose or too tight, there is an adjustment thing here. I recommend you don't go so hard that you split the wood. And if it's too weak that it doesn't hold it, then you're gonna find that your panels are shifting when you put the screws in. Uh, another cool feature is it has quite a lot of area in here so that you can get far down into the project to get maybe even the second pocket hole uh, held while you're screwing it in. So another option for holding these 90 degrees and flush with each other are these little 90 degree L brackets or clamping brackets. These ones are anodized aluminum and they are exactly 90 degrees. So you can use this to clamp the wood underneath and all the way to the edge of it on one side. And then once you put your other piece in, you just have to clamp it and that will hold the two exactly 90 degrees plus flush with each other. So not a bad option too. Let me show you what these look like all set up. You can see with these 90 degree L brackets, as long as you clamp this one to this material with it right at the edge here, when you clamp this material, it forces this to be completely flush. And if you got one on either end, that's gonna be flush all the way along. It's a bit more of a headache to set up, but it gives the same result. And the bonus is this is only $20 for the set of two. All right, at the back of the jig, you've got two different square driver Robertson screwdriver extensions. Take one of these out. Now when you go to put in your screws, I highly recommend that you have something like this, like a little a small electric screwdriver, or if you have a cordless drill with a clutch setting on it, I would set it to a really quite low setting because uh, it's really quite easy to strip the threads in this and then you're gonna have a loose pocket joint. So there you go, this is one method for you to be able to put your virtual pinball cabinet together. Now, I am not a fan of simply putting things together mechanically with screws. The reason why is those screws can loosen up over time and then your pinball cabinet's going a little flimsy a couple years down the road. So when I go to do this with mine, I am gonna be putting some glue inside the edge of that plywood before I screw it down, so that'll help a little bit but not a lot because the edge grain and end grain on wood does not actually work out great. Uh, the glue gets absorbed, it doesn't really stay put. So what I'm gonna do is what I did with my arcade cabinet. I'm gonna make some glue blocks or battens, one inch by one inch by whatever length the corner is, and I'm gonna glue and brad nail those in and that adds a ton of face grain and surface area for that glue to stick and work really well. And then this thing is gonna be absolutely bulletproof. So, now that you know how to do this, let's start doing some stuff on my pinball cabinet. Quick note before we start drilling here, when you start laying out where you want your pocket holes on your actual parts, there are some other things you gotta worry about. You do not want to be starting to put pocket holes right over through your plungers or through your buttons or where your leg bolts go. So, on your uh, parts, figure out where stuff goes. If you don't know the dimensions for like where your leg bolts go, take a look on ngrnet.org and lay those out so that you don't put them there. So for example, I have line one in between, one from one inch from the end on both, and then one in between my plunger and button. And so you can space them out, make sure this is gonna work for you. So let's get going.
Now with really big pieces, you do have the option to undo this and put it 90 degrees onto the base. You can detach these kind of side extensions and then they can act as kind of like levelers for your plywood. So you can lay it down this way. I'm gonna try doing it this way. If I have any issues, I am gonna flip it though. Yes, all the pocket holes are done. There may be a couple down the road for some future trim pieces, but uh, we'll just tackle those when they come up. Now, the next thing before I start putting this together is I need my one by one glue blocks or my battens that go into the corner and get glued and nailed in. So I'm gonna go make those. And if you don't remember uh, from the parts video, I'm using just regular cheap three, four dollar two by fours. So I'm gonna go into the wood shop. I'm gonna use my planer my jointer, my table saw. But for those of you at home that don't have that equipment, all you need is some nice and square, flat, straight pieces that are one inch by one inch. You go to this hardware store and you ask for some trim. I would take a square with you and maybe a straight edge. Just make sure everything's nice and straight and square when you buy it and uh, you cut it into the lengths you need. So I'm gonna go take this and go turn it into some glue blocks. Now to figure the lengths of your glue blocks, you just take a tape measure and start measuring wherever you want to put a glue block and do not go the full length. I would go about an inch, inch and a quarter shorter on each end. That way they don't interfere with a glue up block going another direction on another side. So take your dimensions, make a note of how many you need, right? I need two of this length and two of that length and write it down and just make quick notes of what each piece is for. And then when you're done your list of how many pieces and what lengths you need, you go ahead and take your one inch by one inch stock material that you bought from the hardware store, take it to the table saw and start cutting it up until you get all your glue blocks ready to assemble. Now that we have the glue blocks made, we have to make the corner braces. Now they're essentially the same thing, except we can't make them square. We have to make a 45 degree angle on the one corner. The reason why is if we left it square, we're not gonna be able to get this bracket for the pinball leg in and being able to bolt up properly. So let me show you what I'm talking about. So when you go to install your pinball legs, you're gonna have this bracket on the inside and it's going to get screwed with six screws to the inside of the cabinet. Now this area here is where we have to make that brace so that we can have some glue strength to keep this corner nice and strong. But you can see if we leave this square, it's not gonna fit in there. So the one corner has to have a 45 degree angle. Now in order to get this to fit and have kind of the maximum amount of glue space, you're gonna want these edges here to be one and one eighth inch and no bigger. They could be a touch smaller than that, but um, if you make them too small, then you're losing some glue strength. First step is to figure out how long you want these corner braces to be. So on the front panel, you gotta remember that I have an inch spacing underneath the cab to the bottom and then the thickness of the plywood is three quarter. So really up to an inch and three quarters is where this is gonna start for the brace. And then I don't want it to go past and start interfering with these buttons at all. So for me, I'm gonna stop at six inches and I would highly recommend you don't go less than six inches. That way you get the most strength you can. So I need two of those. And then on the back cabinet, I don't have any buttons to worry about, but I still have the, um, inch gap plus the three quarter inch plywood for the bottom of the cabinet. So that's putting me at 20 and a half. So I'm gonna make two 20 and a halfs for that side. So then taking a two by four, just measure out the pieces you want. So I've got one at 20 and a half. And then rather than make two six inch ones, which are really quite kind of short and a little bit sketchy on the table saw, I could always make it longer and then just cut it up after. So instead of two six inch ones, I will just make it like 12 and a half and always cut it down. Then go ahead and clamp your material to your table and cut this with a circular saw or a jigsaw. For your table saw, you're gonna wanna extend the saw blade up out of the top, probably about two inches. So in this saw, it's this one here. You kind of have to push it in until it locks and then clockwise is to go up. And then we're gonna to wanna to tilt this at 45 degrees. So in this saw's case, it's a clamp right here. Undo it, 
Swing it all the way back till this pointer lines up with 45 degrees and give it a clamp. Now on the end of one of your pieces, you're gonna kind of figure out that, okay, this is gonna be sitting on the top of the table saw. This is gonna sit against the fence. So that means we're gonna be roughly making some kind of angle like this on the end. So what we're gonna do is measure really accurately from the corner over about an inch and a sixteenth, no more than an inch and an eighth. I'd probably go closer to one and one sixteenth. So I'll just use a tape measure and make a mark. There we go. Now this is the mark we're gonna line up with our angled saw blade on the edge that it's going to leave. And uh, then we'll take a cut and see what that looks like. Then take your material and stick it against the fence. Unlock the fence and start moving it over. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna move the fence over so that the edge of this tooth on this side is cutting through that line there. So, that looks about right like that. If I kind of eyeball it in line with the saw blade. So I'm gonna lock that down and then we'll give this a try. Then I'm gonna explain what I'm doing here so that you understand what's up before I start and you can't hear me. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put the material against the fence, start the cut until the blade has kind of come up through the top. And then if I go back like this, there's a chance of kickback where the blade kind of kicks it back at me. So don't be standing right behind it. Uh, another safer thing is get it to cut up to the edge, hold it in place and then reach down with your other hand or even your knee and shut the machine down, let it come to a stop and then you can remove it. And where the cut is, we can measure and see if that's what we like. If we like it, great, turn it back on, push it through. If it's off a bit, we can adjust it before we cut through our entire piece. There's our cut on the end of the piece here. So if we line this up with our tape measure, we're exactly one inch and one sixteenth. So that's perfect, that's what we're shooting for. So we can run all our pieces through. Now, if yours is a bit off, it's really simple. If this is too small, then that means you need to put the fence a little bit closer to the blade so that more of this is sticking out and it'll be bigger. Or the opposite if it is too big of a piece. So if we put the pinball leg brackets in right into the corner where they're gonna sit and we take our corner brace, look at that, that fits perfect. Man, I couldn't ask for anything better. Lots of strength in there, this will be great. Now when you go to install these glue blocks, there's a couple ways you can do this. So if you don't have a brad nailer, you're going to have to pre-drill some holes so that the screws will freely go through. That way you can screw them into the plywood and that'll secure this while the glue dries. That's one way you can do it at home. Uh, but for me, I've got a brad nailer, so when I go to do this, it's just a lot faster. So if you've got one of these electric or pneumatic brad nailers, they work really great. Now, the length of screws that you pick, make sure they are not going through the plywood into the other side. And if you're using a brad nailer, you're gonna to wanna to set this up so that when you drive a nail in here, it doesn't go too far out or not a far enough and this is not being held. So grab a piece of scrap piece that you have and get your safety glasses on, drive a brad nail in it. First off, make sure it for sure went under the surface. And then when you flip it over, you can measure that distance and make sure it is not more than three quarters of an inch. These brad nailers are pretty much the same. They're gonna have some kind of adjustment to adjust how hard that nail gets driven down and how far it goes into the wood. It's hard for you guys to see, but on this drawing right here, it shows if I go this way, it'll hit it harder. And if I go the other way, it'll sink it in less. And then uh, to open it up and put brad nails, there's a lever here and you're using these little brad nails. These ones I've got in here right now are inch and a quarter. So you could go inch and a quarter, maybe inch and a half, uh, but make sure you're not going anything like inch and three quarters, otherwise you're gonna be putting nails right through your project. So I just put in some inch and a half long brad nails. I'm gonna give this a try with some scrap plywood and scrap uh, glue battens. Oh yeah, that'll be good. And more importantly, I don't see any nails sticking out through. And if I drive one next to it to see how far it sticks out through, 
Yeah, it's almost like three quarters of the way through the plywood here. So, perfect. So I'm going to pre-install some of these glue blocks onto the pieces here. Uh, these are the ones that are gonna hold the bottom of the cabinet. So I'm gonna use lots of glue and I'm gonna line it up with the edge here and brad nail it in place. For you guys at home, you might have to pre-drill and screw like I talked about before. And I'm just gonna make sure that they are either centered or all the way to the edge. So if you wanna do a little bit of pre-assembly to know where you have to put them, that would be a good idea. Now another thing I should have mentioned here, before you nail down your glue block here, you're gonna to wanna to match up with where your pocket holes, so in this case the bottom panel, and just make some rough pencil lines where those pocket hole screws are gonna be. That way you don't drive a brad nail or a screw for the glue block right in the same spot where one of those pocket hole screws have to be. Here we go, let's start putting this thing together. We can fix that, it's just, oh my God, that sucks.
Now before we start putting the corner braces in, remember we don't want to be putting any brad nails or screws when we glue this in that are interfering with our pocket hole screws. So looking from the other side, there's one here. The other one's right at the end, so I'm not worried about that. However, we also have these leg braces to be concerned about. So if this is going in like this, because the front is sitting up higher for the bolts and the back is the other way, you got to kind of think, make sure that there is not going to be any brad nails here, because that's where those holes for the bolts for the legs have to go. And we also got these screws that are going in there. So just mark that. Now you know where you can't put a brad nail. Cool, now it's time to put the other side on and I'm not gonna show everything like I did for the first part because it's much the same, it's just on the other side. Uh, I'm gonna put the glue on, make sure I get the glue on the glue blocks. Start with the most important front panel, get it lined up, do the back, and then do a couple of the corner screws and then I would recommend you lay it down so it's a little bit easier to work. Oh yeah, I'm gonna be slap nudging this thing in no time. Cool, let's put in those glue blocks and continue. Sweet, the main cabinet is all done, so let's move on to the back box.
right, cool, the back box is done. However, I do want to reinforce it with those one inch by one inch glue blocks. Uh, that way it'll make it a lot stronger. However, if I just glue those in, I may have some issues with it interfering with other fasteners and hardware, etc. So I have set this up, how it's going to be on the cabinet, and I want to show you a couple spots that you have to keep in mind when you do this. So what I've done is I've taken three of those one inch by one inch glue blocks, put them in the corners, and taken the brace for the monitor and the DMD monitor and put it right back. So this simulates this is as far back as this will ever go if I use these as glue up blocks. And then all I did is I measured from this edge of the brace all the way to the front of the back box and then figured out if this is gonna work or not. If there's not enough room, then I can't use the glue up blocks or I have to go a little bit skinnier. And in my case, I have a quarter inch to spare by the time I have a two inch wide DMD and a three quarter inch speaker panel that's right up at the front. And there's, I believe, an inch and three quarter uh, spacer that I need to make to make that happen. So these one inch blocks will work. Uh, I don't have to make them smaller, so that's good. Now onto the next issue. Now the next issue is if I take this one inch glue up block and I put it right into the corner here, is there anything that's gonna interfere? Well, there turns out there actually is. So we've got our hinge for the back box on the outside here, and there are three of these bolts that have to go up in there. And two of them are not a big deal, but the third one, the furthest one back, actually goes almost right into the corner where that glue up block would be. So that's gonna tell me that I have to stay away at least an inch, maybe even two inches away from the corners so that I can access this. All right, the next thing that you're gonna to have to watch when you're put, placing your glue blocks and your monitor brace is that you have to make room for two of these. These are those wing bolts that are gonna hold your back box down to the top of the cabinet so it doesn't fall down on you. So um, you're gonna have to watch that you don't put a glue block somewhere where you can't put this, where you put your brace for your monitors, where you've got your vent holes, et cetera. And there's only so much over here because uh, it's already outside of the cabinet. So for me, what's gonna work is right there. So I've got enough that I can spin that wing nut on and off and there's enough meat for that. T-nut to be able to get hammered in and lock it securely. And then one of the last things you probably want to think about is if you ever had to change this brace out because you had to change a monitor in the future, how does it come out, right? So we're not going to be gluing this in and I've decided to turn it around and make it so the pocket hole screws come in from the front side. And the reason for that is because if you think about it, everything else comes off from the front. So your speaker panel comes off, your glass comes out, uh, you can undo all the bolts on the VESA mounts for both monitors that come out this way. And as long as everything else is just screwed in and not glued in permanently, then um, this can come fully out. That way you can change it if you need to later. All right, let's take this all down and glue in those glue blocks. All right, that's a wrap on another video from Way of the Wrench, and man, oh man, I am getting excited. Like, look at this thing. It actually looks like a pinball cabinet now instead of just thinking about it and playing uh, pinball on the floor in my living room with monitors on the ground. So, uh, next video up is going to be how to make the drilling jigs for the pinball legs and how to drill them and put them on. And then uh, we'll slowly continue in there. Maybe another video after that on how to put the monitors in uh, and have access to the inside still. So, very cool. If you haven't joined us on Instagram, why don't you join us now, uh, Way of the Wrench, and that way you can see all the stuff going on behind the scenes in the shop uh, in between videos. And until next time, take it easy.